Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Guys, welcome uh, back to the Low Carb MD podcast. Thank you to our Patreon uh, supporters who are keeping this pro uh, program not for profit and completely commercial free. You know, when we bring uh, people on here, it's because we believe in them, we believe in their message. And today we get a returning guest, okay? Somebody who's a friend of mine, somebody who's had a huge oh. impact on me. This is Dr. Joe, uh, Dr. Joe Forestine. Uh, you've probably remember him from a prior episode, I believe it was 92, where he talked about his book, The Man's Diet, and now he's back to talk about his new book. Um, just a little bit of information about him, if you don't uh, remember from that episode, uh, Dr. Joe is our resident expert on everything integrative medicine. He's practiced integrative medicine for over uh, 20 years. He's an assist, uh, assistant professor at Columbia on integrative medicine. Um, he has been invaluable to me, talking to me about diet, uh, nutrition, acupuncture, manual medicine, uh, the the role of uh, supplementation, the role, uh, you know, and things that most, uh, I think most of modern medicine has just kind of thrown their hands up, like, uh, you know, chronic Lyme, EBV, and all these things that are are such a challenge to deal with uh, that, uh, you know, so we've talked a lot about these things over the years, and I'm excited to have him back. He has a new book, and I know about this book and this partnership for years in the making before it happened because we've talked about it. It's the Cannabinoid Cookbook. Guys, we're going to, we're not talking about cannabis. We're talking about the cannabinoid system, and we're going to be educated here today. Um, I highly recommend it. A beautiful book done well uh, with Chef Daniel Green, uh, which some of you may know. So Dr. Joe, tell me what's going, before we get started, what's going on with you? Oh, one last thing. If you haven't read his paper, everybody can't eat everything. Go <laughs> read his paper, okay, which is titled, Everybody Can't Eat Everything. We get so tribal in diet sometimes. And when I read this paper, I think it's like 15 years ago, you wrote that or 10 years ago, you I wrote it. And it really diet. had such an impact on me because yeah. it was like, hey, wait a second, everybody can't eat other things. Some people thrive on meat-based diets. Some people thrive on plant-based diets. Not everybody can have gluten. And so, uh, you know, I know you've been a champion on nutrition for years, so yeah. we're we're yeah. happy to have you back on. I know you don't eat keto, but that's okay. No, no, I like. <laughs> I, I there are a lot of things about keto I like. I generally keep to a kind of low carb diet anyway, just as a general, uh, uh, as, as a general rule. Especially as you know, I, again, you know, whenever you're thinking about what you're going to eat, you also want to look at. We don't have to get into genetics, but if you just look at your genes, you know, you don't need to do 23 and Me and find out all your risks. You can just look at your family. So I know that in my personal family, you know, thank God, uh, cancer is not the thing I'm so concerned about, but diabetes, high, heart disease, stroke, that type of stuff. So that's yeah. metabolic issues. And so uh, your carb intake is kind of the most important thing to me on that one. So personally, yeah, I kind of keep to a, to a lower carb, higher, higher plant fat diet. Uh, for sure. I would say I eat more nuts than I know anybody who I know who eats nuts. I've never eaten so many nuts in my life. You know. What's your favorite nut? I'm just curious before we go. What's your favorite so, nut? So um, I'm supposed to say Brazil nuts. No, no, no. Just Brazil nuts for the selenium. But yeah, right, right, right. No, no. I'm supposed to say Brazil nuts because I have a slightly underactive thyroid. And so selenium actually is quite useful because uh, uh, the um, selenium is important in the immune function, but it also has... An interesting effect because the conversion, the 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 conversion of, of the thyroid hormones needs a uh, an enzyme, and that is the selenoprotein, and so that selenium is important for that. And there's even some evidence. This is very controversial, but there's even some evidence. There's a study on young men 
with hypothyroidism in Germany, and they actually gave them uh, selenium. But they, but by the way, whether you take a supplement uh, of 100 micrograms or something, or you take a Brazil nut, you actually get to the same place. But what they did is when they looked at their autoimmune, you know, thyroid disease, which was Hashimoto's, when you look at that, you, you know, under a microscope, you see the, the thyroid uh, gland has been attacked by the immune system. So you see these, these lymphocytes, which are cells of the immune system attacking the, uh, the thyroid tissue, which is why your thyroid doesn't work. And what they found in these guys, it's a small paper and it's kind of controversial, was that if you had selenium, it actually improved the biopsy of these thyroid glands. In other words, you're almost improving and reducing the amount of uh, 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 of thyroid function. And there isn't any actual treatment for Hashimoto's. Autoimmune thyroid disease, there's no real treatment, but selenium is something to think about. So my favorite, uh, my favorite night is selenium is, it's gonna be Brazil nuts and then obviously walnuts and, because uh, uh, they're omega-3 plant. And I mean, I'm, I'm I, I, any nut is all good to me. They're all mono. Did you see that, you know, you mentioned uh, selenium and uh, immune function. There were some studies, certainly we know, uh, vitamin D deficiency was associated with poor COVID outcomes. Yeah, but I saw the most potent hazard ratio was selenium deficiency. Oh, is I, I don't know if you thought that for COVID yeah. outcomes. You, you know? know, I didn't know that, and yeah. that completely makes sense to me. So another study that's very interesting. This one was done in in um, in New Zealand. Just to, to answer a question, you know, you said that I, I do dietary supplements. I do know a lot about dietary supplements. I actually consult with certain companies that want to, you know, get into that market. But I have to say that food, a lot of the time, is just as potent if properly done. So I am a food in not medicine kind of uh, uh, physician, Food sometimes person. you need supplements. Uh, but what they found in this New Zealand study was that you got to the same blood level of selenium if you took two or three Brazil nuts a day or you took a supplement. So to be honest with you, the Brazil nuts have, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's other advantages of just the selenium pill. I mean, so uh, uh, there's obviously fiber. Um, Anyway, we got totally off topic. No, <laughs> no, it's fine. So we're going to get to the good stuff. We're going to get to the good stuff. People want to hear this stuff. So, yeah. you know, uh, well, before we get started yeah. on, and talking about the book, you know, I want to talk about, and I think that you've seen this, how uh, woefully underprepared doctors are for understanding micronutrients, understanding diet, understanding the effects of diet and understanding that some people just can't eat everything. Can you just talk about, I know we're going to talk about the book, we're going to get to the book, but you know, just in general, you know, uh, we see papers that say selenium deficiency is associated with poor outcomes in COVID. We see right. vitamin D deficiency is associated with bad outcomes with osteoporosis, immune disease, flu. Uh, right. and, and yet, I think modern medicine doesn't know how to interpret this data, right? And we shy away from it as a yeah. profession. Well, so, you know, the interesting thing is that there's kind of almost a spectrum between um, the integrative world and then what makes it across into the, into the actual Western medicine world. I mean, again, there's a, I don't know why it can't all be understanding that this is one piece and there are going to be things that are more useful and things that are less useful. But I'll give you an example. Uh, Omega-3s, um, you know you've made it when a drug company makes Omega-3. <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's yeah. made by a drug company, it's yeah. not worth the medicine. So, he's he's talking that. About, so just to tell everybody what he's talking about, what Dr. Joe is talking about is uh, Amarin, which is a pharmaceutical company, purified EPA and did a five-year study that showed purified EPA omega-3 in the form of vasipa actually reduces coronary plaques, yeah. okay, prevents plaque progression, prevents heart attacks, and prevents cardiovascular mortality. So you're absolutely right. You know, you know you've made it as a as a supplement, right? So it's interesting. And so the same thing is, you know, vitamin D. There's just so I almost feel that what happens is as there is more and more uh data and the data becomes more and more robust eventually vitamin d is no longer alternative it is moving into the western world so for example uh in uh you know when you go into the hospital if you have covid to go back to covid we were checking vitamin d levels and everyone was getting five or ten thousand international units of vitamin d in the hospital during covid 
because they realized that outcomes were much worse. I mean, again, the vitamin D is, is it's a hormone, it's not a vitamin, and it has an impact on every, every all the cells have vitamin D receptors. So it doesn't surprise me. I would, I would say that the next frontier that's going to make it out of uh, the kind of more alternative integrative world and really make it into the Western world is in the next 10 years going to be microbiome uh, evaluation, uh, microbiome modulation. Because there's just no, there's an enormous amount of clinical research being done. And uh, so I think that eventually that's where it will go. It's just so complicated. Um, you know, another one obviously would be uh, eventually we're going to be doing much more uh, genetic testing, uh, much more specific. Uh, you know, um, elegance on these are your risks. These are specific things that you have that are your Achilles heel that you should be aware of, you know. And obviously we understand with genetics, I'm sure you've spoken about this lots of times, that your lifestyle can switch on and off these genes. So it's not as though it's all in your genes and we can give up. You, you, there's epigenetics that does that, you know. Uh, 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 there was a, uh, the famous study by, uh, this is not a keto diet, but this was the study by Dean Ornish, on prostate cancer patients showed that when you went on one of these plant-based, uh, uh, you know, kind of- uh, uh, um, High fiber, food diet, ill food. Right, right, right. but that's def definitely, not, uh, definitely not keto. But in, in addition, there was also such support and there was yoga and there was a stress uh, reduction, etc. It's a hard diet to keep. Smoking reduction. But, right. uh, all of this, but what they did show is that when they looked at uh, the cancer genes that, um, uh, in, in prostate cancer patients, there were a whole load of genes that were more, you know, they were promoting increased uh, prostate cancer. They were switched off because you can switch off your genes. That's epigenetics. So, you know, so I think that those things. Yeah, like the Warburg effect, make you know, even the Warburg effect has been like a big right. topic, right? Right. So, right. so uh, th those things are going to make it. But then there's other things that I just think that uh, they may stay fringy for a long time until there's just so much data that they can't ignore it. And then they take it. You know what I mean? Can, so I, can, I, add on, can I add on to that? So with the with the microbiome, you know, uh, there's certain things that have been a flop, right? Uh, when it comes to microbiome supplements, for example, probiotics, you know, it's never really been shown to help. Uh, and I'm going to give like a contrast of where it seems to, you know, not have an impact. You know, uh, they've been using supplements in obesity. It's never quite panned out. They've looked yeah. at it. Um, in pancreatitis, even made worse in outcomes. And, but then you look at like these fringes of data, you know, particularly C. diff, it's, it's been, you know, pretty well documented that fecal transplant improves the, yeah. the gut health. Yeah. Yeah. And even in the ketogenic diet, I mean, this is something we talk about often, you know, we've shown that it's the microbiota that, that, that dictates the seizure prevention that it's caused by a ketogenic diet. It's truly midi it's truly yeah. Yeah. the microbiome. Yeah. They've wiped right. out the flora of mice and they lose that seizure protection. Right. And they've injected that uh, microbiome into other mice who've had their flora wiped out and they get seizures prevented. So we know that the microbiome is at play with certain things. And you know, Quashicor is another one. So right. zero protein malnutrition, yeah. we thought yeah. is, oh, it's a protein deficiency and a calorie right. issue. Right. Hey, no, it's, that's not the case. There's microbiome changes. So it's exciting, but at the same time, I feel like it's kind of a uh, little foo-foo. Like, you know, everybody's saying it's everything and we don't quite know how to quantify it yet. We so I'll, I'll, tell you, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I know, I, I agree with you. Um, clinically modulating microbiome, the microbiome, uh, has had a lot of clinical effects that um, I've seen with my patients with really mostly autoimmune disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, rheumatoid arthritis, MS. I've really seen some changes because of the link between the gut and also the gut and the brain because so many neurotransmitters are actually made in the gut. You know, the interesting thing is that, and I was never an pro fan because the probiotics are there's a real simplicity to a probiotic. So firstly, just to kind of go over this for everybody, the food is the prebiotic, that's the fiber. The bacteria ferment the, pro the fiber, that's your probiotics or the bacteria. But more importantly is a postbiotic. Those are the actual um, outcome when, you, when the bacteria ferment fiber, or they ferment protein, by the way, because they can ferment either, they come up with lots of different 
uh, molecules, and the most important ones that everybody knows are uh, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, acetate, propionate, which are all very important. So now they're really looking at postbiotics in terms of, I mean, some integrated doctors literally give you propionate and, and butyrate, especially butyrate, because um, it seems to be associated with, 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 with important health outcomes. Um, but one of the other fascinating things is a thing called a parabiotic. Have you come across this? So a parabiotic. No, no, no. Educate me. Yeah. They actually take the bacteria and they heat kill it. So the bacteria no longer exists. But in the milieu of that, what's left were all the other, because frankly, when you take a probiotic, most of the bacteria, even if you're, it's in a little capsule and it's gone into your stomach, I don't know how much actually went, it is it, it sat on the, on the shelf for 20 years, you know, I don't know how much of it's alive. So if it's having an effect, it may not be the bacteria at all. It may be the bacteria, ha they metabolized the prebiotic, the fiber, and the, what they made were the postbiotics. So a parabiotic, you actually heat kill, and, and they have companies that do this now, you heat kill the bacteria, so you don't have any risk of giving any bacteria to anybody and get worried about probiotics and all this stuff, because there's some evidence that probiotics can muck around in a bad way with the immune function of the gut. And instead, what you're really giving is just the uh, the the the, the um, short chain fatty acids and all the other compounds that these bacteria actually make. So you're giving the end product, which should we say, in a in a in a in a parabiotic. I mean, I think that what we're going to find is the trying to. And that's why a stool, um, uh, a you know, a stool transplant, a fecal transplant, is not a couple of bacteria. It's an entire whole system. And how we know the bacteria themselves were the thing that was helping. It may be that the bacteria were all making these, these postbiotics, these short chain fatty acids and all these metabolites that they've made. And that's the help. So we have no idea really. And that's where we're going. But I think we'll get there. Where we're going, I don't know. I think that there's a complexity and the idea of taking one pill and we're all good is uh you know is is too is too reductionist it just isn't going to work and that's what the data seems to suggest you know what i mean you've got to take the whole thing um but i'm, I'm excited about where it's going to go you know we went totally tangible brother it was... no it's okay so let's transition a little bit so tell us so educate us about the cannabinoid systems okay uh, we've certainly uh talked briefly touched about it on the show so tell us a little bit about what yeah. it is, how to modulate yeah. it, what do we need to know? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so, let's, so let's go into the endocannabinoid system. So this is a completely different uh, discussion than what we previously had. Um, firstly, most doctors, frankly, I'm not good about people, physicians are not even aware that they have an endocannabinoid system. So this is literally a system of the body that you could say it's just like the heart is the cardio, you know, the cardiovascular system with the blood vessels and the heart, or the respiratory system, which is the lungs and the airways. This is another system of the body. It's actually an incredibly complex and important system that I'll give you the history of in a second that is um, important essentially in balance. It's in homeostasis of the body. In other words, the main system of the body, whenever something pushes you, your body out of balance, what gets you back Zen into normal function, it back into the best optimal state is your endocannabinoid system. And it's a complex signaling system of the body. And the reason it's called the cannabinoid, the endo meaning inside cannabinoid system is because the research came from cannabis sativa. So this is where we will actually talk a little bit about cannabis. So cannabis is a plant that people have been using for thousands of years. The Egyptians were using it. Um, there's a big argument as to how many types of cannabis there are. Most people, well, not most, some people would say that there's just cannabis sativa, and then there's varieties of sativa. There's one called indica, there's one called ruderalis. Other people say it's, they're all separate. Uh, they all look a little different um, uh, if you actually look at the plants, but in any event, they're versions of the same plant, which is, and, and, and the research was done on, on the main one, which is cannabis sativa. So, um, Essentially, what the, the system does is it's, it's got receptors in the brain and it's got receptors in the body. The CB1 receptors are in the brain. The CB2 receptors are in the body. And it's literally involved in so many different 
uh, systems of the body. So, for example, sleep, mood, stress, metabolism, appetite, digestion, learning, memory, fertility, liver health, cardiovascular health, pain, inflammation. Why so many? Because the system is involved everywhere because you have these receptors all over the place. And so from a clinical point of view, there is even a theory that some of the harder to treat medical conditions, migraine, chronic migraine, IBS, fibromyalgia, there seems to be a lack of, um, of, of the endocannabinoid system working optimally. And so there's actually a concept in the, clinical, in the clinical study called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, and that may worsen your, um, you know, your, your different conditions. And so the history is just to kind of, it'll give you an idea. So basically, it's all about Israel. It's really, it's really all about Israel because the godfather of, 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 of the cannabinoid system is Professor Mahulam at the Hebrew University in Israel. In the 1960s, he was a postdoc. And, and Tro's going to know the story about morphine. We've known, you know, for many years, for thousands of years, that the, 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 the milk of the poppy or morphine is used for pain reduction. And so people went and they say, well, how does it actually work? And they came out with mu receptors in the, in, in, in the body, which are what morphine works on. So he said, OK, how does cannabis work? So thing number one is, what is the active ingredient in cannabis? That's the first thing he wanted to know. What is it that's working? So he isolated THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol, which uh, everybody's have heard of because that's kind of the main ingredient uh, that people standardize when you take medical marijuana or rec recreational marijuana, you're taking THC. He's, he, he basically st um, isolated that in 1964 and then continued doing research and then said, well, if you have cannabis, you must have receptors of the body that the cannabis is working on. If morphine is working on mu receptors, what are the receptors the cannabis sativa is working on? And so 20 years later in the 1980s, they found CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. The CB1 are actually working on iron, they're working on iron channels in the brain that modulate pretty much every neurotransmitter. In other words, all the, the, the chemicals in your brain that govern your mood and activity, dopamine, noradrenaline, glutamine, all of these things, that all the chemicals in the brain that govern brain function, they are all modulated by CB1 receptors. So it's huge. This system is so enormous because any time you are stressed or hurt or whatever, what get, calms you down is not just, you know, being chill, there's actually a system to calm you down and get you back into balance. That's the endocannabinoid system. I just want to finish up the end of the story because it's just so cool. Then, basically, there's two other things that Professor Mahonam came up with. Number one is a really obvious system uh, question. If we have in our brains CB1 receptors and in our body CB2 receptors, we must have our own natural cannabis. We must. Because why would the body have these receptors if it didn't have its own cannabis? And so in, uh, in the 1990s, they isolated two cannabinoids. One of them is called anandamide. It stimulates the CB1 receptors of the brain. It comes from the Sanskrit Ayurvedic word for bliss. And the other one is called 2-AG. These are really important. So you actually make your own cannabis in your body. So whenever you have any kind of damage to the body or, 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 or upset or need to sleep or whatever's going on, what calms you down and gets you back into balance is the 2-AG and the anandamide working on this system and stimulating everything to get back into balance. And then the final thing, which is literally where the book comes from, is he came up with uh, Dr. Professor McCollum, and this was just at the end of the 1990s, with the concept of the cascade or the entourage effect. And this is literally what the book's about. Cannabis, cannabis sativa does not just have THC and CBD. That's what everyone only knows two cannabinoids, THC and CBD. CBD is a supplement. THC is what you get in medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. There are at least 140 cannabinoids. And Professor McCollum then came up with the idea, well, there's a beauty to plants. 
All of these cannabinoids are working on the system in different ways. And so you get what's called the entourage or the cascade effect. So all together, you're hitting the system from here and here and here and here and here, millions of different ways. And so the system is, is much more stimulated. The book is literally 11 foods and spices that work on the cascade effect. They all work on the endocannabinoid system. None of them are cannabis. None of this is cannabis sativa. This is not a, a book about pot recipes. There are a million of those books. There is literally only one book telling you which food you need to have a cannabinoid rich diet. So I think one of the, uh, one of the superfoods that most people know about is cacao. Oh yeah. Right? <clears throat> one of the foods that, uh, you know, it's, it's tons of, uh, uh, typically, cacao comes with a ton of magnesium, electrolyte, right. comes right. with a ton of healthy fat. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it has uh, effects on that endogenous. Well, we should, it's really the opioid receptors, cannabinoid receptors. Can you talk a little bit about cacao? Yeah. So I love cacao. That's actually one of my faves. In fact, anytime I do any kind of uh, uh, thing for the for, for, for a reel on Instagram or I do it, I'm a, it's very funny. The guy I wrote the book with is a big deal. I'm not the big deal in this in this relationship. He is. He's an international celebrity chef. He's been on number, numerous series on the Food Network. He's the new celebrity chef for Qatar Air. And he's a big deal. He's also a spectacularly good cook. And I'm an awful cook and so it's so funny because anytime you do any media stuff they're always like oh dr joe can you cook something and it's like i can i'm not sure you really want to watch what happens <laughs> there so i always do the same thing i do the cacao you know cold brew smoothie because I can make a smoothie because it's really idiot proof. There's a blender, there's some stuff, you put it in and switch it on. So uh, cacao is actually one of my, one of my faves. It literally uh, is considered, I mean, in Mayan times, it was considered to be the, the equivalent of ambrosia, which was the food of the gods of Greece. So the food of the Mayan civilization, the food of the gods was cacao. And what I loved about it, about this is whenever you, you hear about a food or a spice or an herb, it's always very useful to find out what people originally used it for. Because there is, you know, the, the, the tradition of our ancestors and what they came up with for thousands of years is probably on. So would you believe they used it as an antipyretic, meaning they used chocolate to reduce your fever. And most important, well, then I believe they use chocolate to reduce inflammation. How does it reduce inflammation? It's, or it's got lots of anti-inflammatory properties, but the one I want to focus on today is that the cacao is working on the endocannabinoid system. So very briefly, let me tell you how cacao works on your endocannabinoid system. Because I said before, the main part of the book was not to have everything works on this receptor and that's it. It's to work on every this part of the system so together you're really enhancing your endocannabinoid uh, activity so cacao is working on the following thing as i said before the cb1 receptors of the brain which modulate all of those different chemicals in the brain all those neurotransmitters for mood and alertness and 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 and, and, and focus all of that the cb1 receptors are stimulated by that compound that we found called anandamide. So anandamide um, is a CB1 receptor agonist. It stimulates those. Now, obviously, like every other transmitter in the brain, you need to have something to get rid of it. Because if not, you'd be continuously stimulating the endocannabinoid system. And I don't think no one would do anything. We'd be too chilled. We'd, it would just be, everyone would be chilled all the time. And I don't think anyone would be, we'd still be in the trees, not getting very far. So obviously what we need to do is to have a system to get rid of the, 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 the anandamide. And so there is an enzyme and the enzyme um, is called FAAH. That's an enzyme in the body that breaks down anandamide. Okay, so that's how the body normally works. Chocolate contains two compounds. One is called N-linolethanolamide and the other one is called n Oleoethanolamide, those are compounds that we know. What do they do? They inhibit the FAAH enzyme, meaning they stop the breakdown of anandamide. It's literally like 
almost the same as uh, in depression, we use a medicine, uh, all those things, Selexa and Lexapro, like SSRIs to, br to, to stop the brain, no, it's not breakdown, it's basically reuptake of those of, of the serotonin in the brain in the brain so you keep happy this one we keep your anandamide levels high because we put we inhibit the enzyme that breaks down anandamide that's how it works you know one of the uh one of the things that i found interesting when i was uh researching kind of the endo uh cannabinoid system and um uh, kind of endogenous cannabinoids and endogenous opioids is uh exercise you know yes. there was an amazing study i just saw that talked about how exercise promotes both endocannabinoids and endogenous opioids and literally the grade of exercise the intensity and the duration right uh matched the the uh pet scans which showed the activation of these areas in the brain right so literally it is truly a mental health tool yes. exercise, right? Yes. And, it, and it was so elegantly shown with PET scans. And we all kind of know it, that the, this runner's high that we yeah. get, right? And the exercise high we get, we don't realize that, hey, there are actually, it is truly a stress relief. A you know? hundred percent. And you're stimulating your endocannabinoid system. You know, it's funny because exercise is a huge one. Um, and then, uh, you know, the one that we didn't talk about in the booth, there are, look, 140 different cannabinoids. We didn't hit all of them. But uh, um, uh, another one, it turns out that actually you, there are compounds that are cannabinoid-like found in cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous coming from the word crucifix because they have the, 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 the leaves have a kind of cross to them. And that's broccoli and cauliflower and bok choy and, 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 and kale. Oh, and vegetables. <laughs> and so, yeah, but, you know, would you would you believe, here's a surprise, that they actually have among the millions of other pro healthy properties and vitamin K and cancer promote, you know, cancer uh, um, uh, inhibiting activities. Uh, they also contain natural cannabinoids, you know, so um, it's funny how you can, th those things you can do. I suppose, you know, the way I want to, like in terms of exercise, one of the things exercise is supposed to do is upregulate. In other words, increase the amount of receptors of the CB1 and CB2 receptors. And so permit me, uh, Tro, I want to give another food, which we've talked about, but I want to explain how it works on the endocannabinoid system. It's like, you know, all the foods I'm going to describe, you probably know them, but what most people aren't aware of is that they actually have an effect. Not only are they awesome, but they're especially awesome because they're working on a system you may not even know knew you had, who's and the system's so important so the the, the the one we've talked about is the omegas so omega-3 actually has an effect on the endocannabinoid system and the reason is kind of almost associated with with exercise so omega-3s uh you have plant omega-3s like we talked about walnuts and we have uh, we have fish omega threes, which are which are fatty fish, herring and and mackerel and salmon and tuna and uh, uh, and also find in anchovies and sardines. And uh, so uh, human diets. I bet you've spoken about this lots of times. Omega sixes, which are polyunsaturated fats, are tend tend to be more inflammatory. Omega threes tend to be tend to be less inflammatory. So the healthy diet, the Mediterranean diet. The original Paleolithic diet was much higher in omega threes, and that was less inflammatory. But what it does for the uh, the the endocannabinoid system is quite fascinating. So I just want to kind of describe how this goes. Let's go back to anandamide and 2AG. So they're our friends. We make them in the body. They are literally our natural homegrown cannabis. What are they? They are fatty acids. They, I mean, the derivatives of fatty acids. What fatty acids are they derived from? They're derived from omega sixes in plants, uh, 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 in the diet. Omega sixes. Okay. So, basically, you make you have all this omega six. Let's say you have I don't know peanut oil or whatever it is. It's full of you know, vegetable oil. It's full of omega sixes. Uh, it's also, as I said, inflammatory. But it also makes the body will turn it into anandamide and 2AG. Now the body's very clever. So if you have masses of it, you're not going to suddenly get masses of anandamide and 2-AG. It doesn't, you know, the body won't want to do that. So what does it do? Because it doesn't want you to be too chilled out. It needs the endocannabinoid to work properly. What does it do? 
it down regulates the receptors in the body, meaning what it does is it starts having less receptors available in the cells. So the, the endocannabinoid system is actually working on like working less. OK, because you have too much of the uh, of the potentially you'd be making too much 2AG and too much anandamide. You'd be stimulating the endocannabinoid system too much. And so what it does is the body says, OK, um, I'm going to just uh, I'm going to I'm going to take away some of those receptors. So you can you can you can you'll have to, the endocannabinoid system will be stimulated less. So what happens when you take omega threes is it's in a ratio of omega three to omega six. So when you start eating more omega-3 and you're having more omega-3 as opposed to uh, uh, more omega-6, what's happening is the, those, you're, you're stopping those receptors from being downregulated. So the level of those receptors in the body, meaning all of the CB1 and CB2 receptors, they stay the same, just to kind of visualize. So if the body wants to get rid of 50, it's got 100 receptors. If you have too much omega-6, it gets rid of 50 of them. OK, because it's going to have too much stimulation of the system. If you start eating a lot of omega threes, the body therefore stops getting rid of the receptors and you're back to 100 again. So, again, that's working on the endocannabinoid system, but a completely different way from what we just said with chocolate. So, and that's the point of the book. It's not, you know, every there's a there's a there's a cannabinoid i'll, I'll tell you about because a lot of the, the of the well, foods well, can, um, I, can i harp yeah. on that a little bit because yeah you know it's not more is not always better and i yes. think you hit that point because you know we know for example type 2 diabetes metabolic syndrome what happens these people get resistant and their endocannabinoids there are like through the roof right and they're just resistant to it and i was just thinking to myself you know uh you know it's been shown to actually just like we get the munchies right imagine you're resistant to these endocannabinoids and you're just increasing the more and more endogenous endocannabinoids right what's going to happen you're going to stimulate your appetite right at some point the brain's still sensitive right, right? But the body's not sensitive to it the muscles and all the thermogenesis everything right and you you just get you get hungry and in fact when you lose weight it's been shown that the endocannabinoids actually decrease when you when you're, when you, there's even evidence that low carb diets lower endocannabinoids. So it's, there's a lot of, I think there's probably this resistance you're talking about, and more is not better. That's right. No, it, it really is balanced. That's the same thing. You know, it's um, uh, um, resistance is important, you know, insulin resistance. And, um, but, you know, just to go on to that, there's another food. And which is included in the book, which you'll love, which actually will, we'll, we'll talk about this. Um, so the other spice, there are loads of spices, but one of the spices that we talk about a lot of, everyone's heard of, it's turmeric. Uh, and the uh, kokumi longa is the, is the actual spice. And, um, uh, and the thing about turmeric, it's got, it's got lots of anti-inflammatory properties. We use it in arthritis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's an antioxidant. Um, it increases brain-derived neuro, neuro, neurotrans, neurotrophic factor, which seems to be important in Alzheimer's. So there's lots of good reasons why you should be having turmeric. But what it does do in the endocannabinoid system is it is actually a CB1, meaning the receptors in the brain. It's an antagonist. It's actually blocking the cb1 receptors now why are we doing that because of exactly what we said because it's a balance because you want to put it all together and because i bet that when you look at these cannabinoids in cannabis sativa in the plant cannabis the 140 different compounds i guarantee some of them are going to inhibit the system just like others are going to stimulate the system because that is the beauty of nature it is so elegant um, that you'll find that in, a, in an herb. You'll never find that in a drug. The drug only does one thing. You know what I mean? It's very singularly focused. It's like a, it's like a cruise missile. It does one thing. But the herb does lots of things together in a much more elegant way. So we like turmeric. And so eating turmeric and, you know, whether the, the result, the research will bear this out, but some people certainly will eat it in terms of helping with weight. But the idea from the endocannabinoid system is that may impact on your appetite, reducing CB1 uh, activity, inhibiting the CB1 receptors will have a, because everybody knows that when you're stimulating your CB1 receptors, you're getting the munchies. 
and the munchies is not the way to lose weight. So it's just a very interesting, and that's what I love about the way, you know, I know we, we wrote the book, but the point was that it, there, there's an elegance to this that we're trying to get to, which is plants are much more complicated than a drug. And it's all of these things together that are enhancing your endocannabinoid system with a cannabinoid rich diet. Yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a drug that was pulled off the market that attacked, the, it was an obesity drug uh, I don't know if you remember it. It was it was approved in the United uh, in the EU, uh, Ramanabad or something like that. I okay. what it was, which actually was a agonist of the cannabinoid system. Okay. Uh, it was like an inverse agonist, and it just right. made people not hungry. Right. right. So they ended up pulling it off the market. Oh, yeah, yeah it made people that. not hungry, but they but they pulled it off the market because it had incredible psychiatric like suicide rates were up and you well, know, we'll psychiatric just about, right i mean just think about what you're doing you're not just like you know this is the complexity of this yeah. this system impacts on every other kind of you know neurotransmitter in the brain so it's going to govern mood and it's going to govern you know the dopamine system and alertness and memory and focus and all these things so you know the idea of oh we're just gonna have one drug to stimulate the system as well. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. It, they were like, wow. It, oh, you know, like Sanofi it. was like, oh, it, low, it, it helps people lose weight. They put it on the right, market. Right, right, right. And so then I all of a sudden it was like that. disaster. You 100%. know? I mean, yeah. that's why eating turmeric and, and the Ayurvedic, the Indian medicine way of turmeric actually is taking a scoop, literally the stuff, putting it in almond milk or something and drinking that every day. So we're talking about real doses. You could take it as a supplement. It's like 500 milligrams, a thousand. The other thing is that it's not always absorbed very well. So some people take it with black pepper. That's a whole thing unto itself. But there are good versions of turmeric. But just that's a neat way to think about it. And it's potently anti-inflammatory and, and, and probably anti-cancer and antimicrobial and, you know, uh, like everything else. But I just love that, that that's the elegance of this system. You know? Yeah, I think we don't real we don't appreciate sometimes that, hey, it's not just, you know, somebody, you know, uh, 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 smoking a little reefer. I think that's like the, the modern, you know, person's understanding. These are right. very complex. There are multiple different receptors in the brain, the muscle, the heart, fat tissue. Um, 100% everywhere, everywhere. And inflammation, which is why CBD, when in the right dose, probably, you know, has some effects. I do want to say, though, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of medical marijuana. I really am. But for specific things, and not for everybody and everywhere. And I think that in Honestly, in adolescence, I'm very concerned about people with chronic marijuana use in adolescence. I think that there's a lot of research. I think that is a problem. And so that's something to worry about. But in terms of marijuana, medical marijuana, that's, you know, clinical grade for things like pain, it probably reduces pain, especially nerve pain by about 30% in multiple sclerosis. It's used for anadispa spasmodic and it's very useful in uh nausea for chemo and i gotta be honest with you uh there's some really good reasons to use it you know uh yeah, i mean look, look i think i think one of the things that we've you know one the book is amazing i mean you go through cacao black pepper flax cinnamon you know cloves uh make i do want to hit truffles and my favorite, my favorite end, you truffles. didn't talk about this which is my favorite Oh my God, I love truffles. Oh, no, no, I got to give the truffle because I love, truffles is my favorite too because yeah. of the story, but we're going to get to truffles, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 what's that? I mean, we're going to get to truffles for sure. Yeah, yeah, Oh, yeah, yeah hit yeah. me with truffles, man. Hit me, ha, tell me everything. Oh, I'll tell me truffles? Okay. It I is love. my favorite. Oh my God, I can't believe you. Okay, gotta, so truffles is- Why do I love truffles, man? Why, why do, is it just because it's ridiculously expensive? No, 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 it's not really, so, so- Firstly, Daniel, you know, my chef guy, he, 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 we're using more, I suppose, truffle infused olive oils and stuff like that, because, because they can be really expensive. So truffles literally are, they're fungus, you're eating fungus, let's call it what it is. Yeah, and yeah. the, uh, it's found in oak, the roots of oak trees. And again, uh, Hippocrates says this, he says, nature does nothing uselessly. If something's happening in nature, there's a reason for it. You know what I mean? So why would the, I'm going to ask all these types of questions when it comes to truffles. Why would truffles hang out in the roots of oak trees? What's in it for the truffle? And what's in it for the, for the oak trees? In the same way is, why is our microbiome full of these bacteria? They must help us and we must help them. Because if not, it wouldn't work. And so, um, so the truffles, what they're doing is, 
on the roots of the oaks and they take like seven to 10 years literally to kind of grow and get somewhere. What they're doing is increasing the surface area in those roots. So you're getting more nutrients. So the truffles getting fed, the oaks are getting fed. Everyone's having a nice party. Um, now truffles are, and, and again, there are, there are lots of species. There's like black and winter and summer and burgundy. And some of them are super, super expensive, which is why they're called the diamond of the kitchen. And they've been used by Greeks and they've been used by, you know, by the, the Amorites were using truffles. Uh, the Greeks actually thought, this is very cool, that truffles were made by lightning striking the earth. And that's what made a truffle. You know what I mean? So, uh, but you know, truffles, they have calcium. Yeah, I'm going to get a lightning rod and put it right next to my tree then, you right. know? That's, that's I'll get to the endocannabinoid part because I think the endocannabinoid is so cool and really proves that nature does nothing uselessly. So then I, I'm going to get to that. But the other thing about truffles, because you should really eat them, they are a complete animal, a, a plant protein. So that means they have all the essential amino acids. There are a lot of plant proteins that have all the essential amino acids, but truffles actually do. And that's really useful. So the deal about truffles, it's Roman times that everybody knows about, is you've got these pigs. So these pigs in southern France, they can go down about four feet to go find the truffles. So the question number two is, What's in it for the pig? What, why are these pigs that get trained? By the way, they've started training dogs to do it because the pigs will eat all the truffles. So what's up with the truffles? So it turns out the truffles are full of our friend anandamide. They're literally made of anandamide. That's what's in truffles. When you have truffle oil, you're basically having pure anandamide. So the pig, What's in it for the pig is the pig is basically looking around for its truffle, you know, its pig marijuana because it wants to get stoned. So it'll dig down. And that's why they had to use dogs instead of pigs, because the pigs were getting high and eating as many truffles they, as they like. So you've worked out what's in, in it for the pig. But what's in it for the truffle? Why is a truffle? The truffle has, doesn't have an endocannabinoid system. Why does a truffle have all this anandamide? Well, the answer is it is not about the truffle. It's about the pig. And here's how it goes. What is the truffle trying to do? The truffle is trying to propagate and have its spores everywhere. So what does it do? It's full of anandamide. It attracts the pig. The pig eats the truffle. The, the, the truffle gets digested in the gut. The spores are not broken down in the gut. And the spores go out all over the place in the stool, all over Southern France. So now you have truffles all over southern France because of these high, these, these, these stone pigs. And that is an antibiotic. But you see, nature does nothing uselessly. Nothing. You know, uh, we had a previous guest on, uh, Kean Foley, who uh, has a book called Don't Eat for Winter. And he talks a lot about the oak tree and the squirrels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and, you know, the oak tree wants the acorns to be eaten right? Yes. It wants it to be like, it wants it to, its acorns to be addictive to the animal. So it stuffs its face and it right. hides away everything right. that it can't eat, right? And stores it away. So it's a symbiotic relationship. The plant wants 100%. to be eaten at a certain 100%. time. 100%. By the animal. And if you look at, you know, there's other things in, in nutrition that stimulate other animals to eat. Same thing with fruits, right? They ripen at a certain time when it's yep. is ready to be germinated and spread. Yep a lot of the same way. So the fruit becomes sweet from being unsweetened, right? So that an animal eats yeah. it, right? I, I, and, and the seeds come out and the seeds are Bingo. hard. Yeah. You know, I want to tell you funny. And I, even, I, but you know what took me a long time was yeah. dairy, understanding dairy. Cause you know, in the weight loss realm, right? You never, you know, you want to not be triggered to eat, right? right. So if something, so if nuts, Right, are definitely triggered to eat. It's yeah. not that they're unhealthy, they're very healthy. Yeah, yeah. But they're a trigger for people to eat because yeah. they lead to this foraging signal. Same thing with yeah. fruits. It, you know, and dairy is the most obvious one out of all of these. What is the design of dairy, right? To make right. another mammal eat. It has those right. endo, yeah. oh, a ton of endo, you know, uh, um, a case of morphins, yeah. right? Yeah. That just make the brain light up. And all, you know, nature is not dumb, right? Like right. it has a purpose. Right? That's right. And it's just amazing the way you brought it up. I, 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 so, so I have a funny show about my kids. So, you know, the area where I live, we have, we have, uh, we have uh, oak trees and we have these acorns and he's two. So he's very excited 
This is my youngest kid, as you know, Trevor. Um, and uh, so he's collecting all these acorns and like, okay, uh, we have acorns. And, and, and they're his treasures, you know. So you have to like, you have to validate that. You can't throw them away. That's disrespectful. So I, I told you I'm a bad cook. Let me tell you. So I Google, can you eat acorns, right? Because I know that in England, which yeah. is where I'm from, we have roasted chestnuts. That's like yeah. a thing. I yeah. roasted chestnuts are awesome. So then I look and there's this whole thing on the internet. You can yeah, make, you can make acorn pudding. Yeah. You can yeah, make absolutely. acorn so You can, but yeah. I clearly can't. So I put <laughs> this thing in the oven and I read the directions, obviously not well. And I make this acorn. I say, okay, this is going to be like roasted chestnuts. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be a god at my house. <laughs> we try and eat them. And they are so bitter and so kind of astringent and revolting. And I was like, okay, so maybe uh, I'm going to leave it for the squirrels next time. Because let me tell you, it was not, it was not a powerful moment. Do you want, you want to hear something funny? An acorn, right? When you look at an acorn, uh, the macronutrient partitioning is about... 50% fat, about mm -hmm. 10% protein, and 40% mm -hmm. carbohydrate. Interesting. Right? Which is the exact same uh, uh, macronutrient partitioning of breast milk. Oh, very interesting. Yes. Right? It's the exact yeah. similar, right? And if, you know, uh, it's just I found that that's what uh, Kian Foley talks about. Listen, very give us some, give us some, Dr. Joe Feuerstein, give us some last words of advice. One, how do we live a healthy life? How can we make, you know, how can we take advantage of our endocannabinoid system? What are like quick tips you can do? And then where does somebody find you, find the book, you know, so start, give me like the five things you would do to, to the five hacks you would do. Let yeah. me do perfect. Let me start with where I find. Uh, so, so if you want to uh, find me online, uh, it's uh, Dr. Joe Feuerstein, you know, on, on Facebook or, or, or LinkedIn or, or, um, or Instagram. I have a website, Dr. Feuerstein, which no one can spell. F for Frank, E for Edward, U for Umbrella, E for Edward, R for Robert, S for Sugar, T for Tony, E for Edward, I for Iglo.com. On it, I've got this video blog. I, I do look and read research all the time. And anything I think is interesting, I do a two minute video blog on. So you can always sign up to see that. Um, uh, the book is actually killing it on Amazon, killing it. It's the number one new uh, book in its, uh, in its, in its you know, uh, categories, uh, natural medicine or spices or whatever it is on Amazon. And it is actually doing very well. And that's probably him because he has an he's got you know tens of thousands of people follow him whereas uh, i'm 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 the uh i i i'm the i am the i am the adult you know we're the I'm, lowly doctors you know I'm the lowly doctor, yeah, we're right. the lowly doctors that's doctor. right that's right he's the he's the very good looking chef who uh, who sits there but we do this great show together where he cooks and i talk and um, it, it works really well and he's he's very affable and and uh, you know it's going very well um things that are important um, so we talked about the fact that if you to stimulate your endocannabinoid system, there's no question that the, 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 your, that your your exercise has to be. I mean, it should be literally six times a week. I, I believe we should not exercise every day. I think six times a week is reasonable. And I think um, you know the, the recommendations again are going to be aerobic with some strength and, and, and balanced training, the usual. But I think that's so important uh, because of the endocannabinoid system. And then the foods that I love. I have no issue with 85% dark chocolate. I think you should eat chocolate every day. 85% dark chocolate. You know that dark chocolate has oh, no- I do 100%, man. Right. Oh, anything, less, anything less than 100%, I will overeat. You are good. You are good. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, hey, that's my boy. So uh, 85, or if you can take it 100, that's good. So just remember, that has practically, it's got fiber, more fiber than- you know, I'm not talking about chocolate. Chocolate's a candy. Chocolate's a, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking yeah, about yeah, dark yeah. chocolate. That's a medical food. I think we should be eating dark chocolate. I think our oils should be truffle related. I really do. They should have omegas. I think the omega three foods uh, uh, um, uh, foods are really important as a really important protein. Like fish, avocado. Absolutely, all of that. And then the other thing is your spices are incredibly important. We didn't fit, we didn't say this, but many of the spices turmeric and oregano and thyme and uh, uh um uh cloves and cinnamon they all contain the same essential oil uh which is beta carophyllin and beta carophyllin stimulates cb2 receptors it literally does Can cannabis essential oil is 40 percent beta carophyllin i'm giving you not cannabis i'm giving you 
loads of other spices that all have health benefits, but they all still work just because they're all full of beta carotene. They work on exactly the same receptors as cannabis does. So that's a cannabinoid rich diet. Awesome. That sounds good. I'm going to go, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stick with my cacao. I'm going to add in some truffle. Now that the Dr. Joe said, so I'm going to tell my wife not to pay attention to the bank account, you know, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not to worry about it. Anything else go. coming up from you that, that, you know, I know you're doing a lot of shows and cooking shows. So doing, and doing, uh, doing some great shows. And, and so doing more stuff on everyday health, which is this collaboration. It's 60, 60 million views a month. We, uh, on that website. So we get an enormous amount of, uh, of volume. Uh, it's different diets for different problems because everybody can't eat everything. The one we just did was a, was a lady. She's so sweet. She's 32. Uh, and she has metastatic colon cancer. So we talked to her and she's got a two-year-old kid. It's not so easy. What are you going to feed yourself that's actually going to be okay for your kid? So it's me and Daniel talking. He's cooking. Uh, it's very interesting to watch because it's nice to watch him cook. And then he, he let me, you know, for foods. And then we have come of experts and then we have the patient. The next one we're going to do, uh, we're hoping to film. We did heart disease recently, uh, is actually mood disorder. So on the DL, that's the one we're doing. The diet we use for mood because uh, uh, what you eat affects your brain. Oh, we talk about that all the time. Yeah. We talk about it all the time. Absolutely. Dr. Joe, thank you so much. Guys, the best Patreon supporters, thank you for making this a commercial free, not-for-profit podcast. Uh, we, when we bring somebody on here, it's because we believe in their message. There's no, uh, commercial or financial interest. So guys, thanks for tuning in. Dr. Joe, thank you. Thanks. Always a pleasure, Tro. Take it easy, buddy.